Today in the EU, the International Red Cross urges end to hostilities as Israel-Hezbollah conflict threatens regional spillover. The situation in the Middle East is rapidly deteriorating. Though not officially termed a war, the escalating conflict across Gaza, northern Israel and southern of Lebanon suggests a new regional conflict in the Middle East and is rapidly taking shape. Israel's operation against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and Beirut, which resulted in the death of one of Hezbollah's leaders, has triggered missile retaliation and caused severe civilian casualties. More than 550 people, among them dozens of children, have died. And thousands have fled the violence since Israel's most intense barrage. The International Committee of the Red Cross is urging immediate de-escalation, civilian protection and unhindered humanitarian aid to prevent further catastrophe, particularly in Gaza, where the situation is already dire. Hello and welcome. I am Evikiori and this is Today in the EU. In today's episode, we're bringing to you a voice from Gaza, Hisham Mhana, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, to explain what's the current situation on the ground. And our senior editor, Georgi Gotev, who will help us to unpack the current situation in southern Lebanon. Georgi, starting with you, the situation in the Middle East seems to be deteriorating. Currently, the conflict continues not only in Gaza, but also in the northern part of Israel and the southern part of Lebanon. What is exactly happening there these days? Well, it's not yet uh, called uh, war, but it looks uh, very much like uh, another Middle East war. Uh, the new development is that Israel conducted uh, a successful covert operation against Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. First, it was the shock it created uh, with the exploding uh, communication devices and then with uh, precision attacks on uh, Hezbollah leaders and uh, weapons hidden in Lebanon among the civilian population. Hezbollah tries to retaliate by firing missiles at Israel, but the Iron Dome of Israel is stopping most of them, apparently. It largely looks like a disaster for Hezbollah. And this is coming with you know, Lebanon suffering major civilian casualties. Uh, video footage we have seen is uh, dramatic. Uh, I have a message for the people of Lebanon. Israel's war is not with you. It's with Hezbollah. For too long, Hezbollah has been using you as human shields. Don't let Hezbollah endanger Lebanon said Benjamin Netanyahu, while the operations continue. We know that uh, Hezbollah is largely financed and controlled by Iran, uh, the arch enemy of uh, Israel, Mm -hmm. which is reportedly getting close to being able to produce uh, nuclear warheads uh, for its ballistic missiles. Israel is determined uh, not to allow this to happen. Iran uh, has vowed uh, massive retaliation since the assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh on Iranian soil last July. We haven't seen such retaliation until now. This is where we stand. What is the root of the escalation in this particular region? The roots are, of course, uh, deep. A primary uh, example of um, regional conflict in the Middle East is the uh, Arab-Israel dispute that has existed and is still ongoing between the Arab nations and Israel, uh, more particular these days uh, between the Palestinians and Israel. Mm -hmm. Other examples of conflicts include the Kurds versus Syria in the context of the Syria war, the Iraq-Iran war and constant tensions, other conflicts in Syria, Jordan, Yemen, and of course Lebanon. And uh, in all these conflicts, uh, foreign powers have been playing uh, their part. How is the international community perceiving what's happening south of Lebanon? It's true that only political solutions on a national and international level can de-escalate the situation in north of Israel and in Gaza. Can this be expected soon or has this opportunity been lost? The European Union foreign policy chief uh, Josep Borrell uh, uh, said that uh, the escalation between uh, Israel and uh, Lebanon's Hezbollah is almost a full-fledged war. In that sense, uh, my analysis uh, coincides with his. The world's expectations are becoming reality. And we need peace in the Middle East. 
because the ongoing escalation is a danger for the whole region. But in his words, uh, Europe's uh, worst fears about the spillover mm -hmm. are becoming uh, a reality. Borrell said uh, civilians uh, are paying a high price and uh, he calls for all diplomatic efforts uh, to prevent a full-blown uh, war. Those sad developments are taking place against the background of the session of the United Nations uh, General Assembly in mm -hmm. New York. And this is the place where the entire diplomatic potential of the world is present at the same time. So let's hope that the UN would be able to avoid a spillover. If not, uh, let's be aware that regional wars like this uh, will deeply affect also our societies here in Europe, mm -hmm. perhaps more than in other continents. So let's hope the EU and uh, its member states uh, will do their uh, utmost uh, to defuse the tensions. And Georgi, in Gaza the situation keeps getting worse. And Hisham and the International Red Cross is calling for an end to the hostilities. Hisham, you're currently on the ground in Gaza where things are not getting better. Could you explain to us how things are there right now? The humanitarian situation in Gaza is beyond catastrophic. We are closing to one year now since uh, October 7th, 2023. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed in Gaza in particular, but towards the worse. There's more uh, displacement amongst the community. Mm -hmm. The majority of this population in Gaza is displaced. They lack the access, the proper access to sufficient quantities of clean water, uh, hygienic items, sufficient amount of uh, nutritious food, and access to healthcare service. The healthcare system in Gaza has been devastated by the armed conflict. Humanitarian workers do not have the enough space to operate. They do not have the ability to achieve the uh, basic level of, or the minimum level of a meaningful humanitarian response that people can feel. Humanitarian aid is fluctuating, and this also puts further and further restrictions. Mm -hmm. And on top of all, there is absolutely no sense of safety and security people can feel, including the medical missions, including the humanitarian workers. So I was spending yesterday at the International Committee of the Red Cross Field Hospital in Rafah, which is one of mm -hmm. very few hospitals that remain operational in that area. And I could see while interacting with the patients there, the undescribable trauma, both physical and psychological, of losing a family member, losing a home, having to be living in or forced to live in dignified living conditions uh, without being able to provide for the family their basic needs and without knowing if they will ever witness the next morning. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant feeling of distress, suffering, without knowing uh, how the near future would look like, what it will bring for them. And you talked about the displaced people. Where are these people living now? The population in Gaza has been in a closed loop of ongoing displacement due to the, you know, on constantly regenerating armed hostilities and the frequently issued evacuation orders everywhere now and then by the Israeli military. And the majority of the population in Gaza was this, has been displaced in southern Gaza Strip, uh, more in the Mawasi area of Khan Yunus Governorate and the middle area. The designated humanitarian zone uh, announced by Israel represents only 10 to 12 percent of the total space of Gaza Strip, which is already a tiny piece of land, only 365 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. And there is over 2.2 million people. The majority of them are displaced. There is still an, est an estimated number of few hundred thousands of civilians still in northern Gaza, suffering also from different challenges in terms of having access to food and, ha and sheltering, etc., and there are common challenges facing the displaced community in Gaza. First of all, they fear that they will suffer more in the next winter than the previous one. Earlier this week, I was in one of the displaced camps in the Al Balah area in the middle zone, and there is approximately a, a thousand family who live in tents there. Uh, and we were providing, you know, uh, clean water, like approximately forty thousand liters of drinking water every day are distributed there, just to help alleviate the suffering of walking for long distances and carry uh, water buckets by the children. Mm -hmm. And it rained for only three minutes, and it was already drowning. Now, over the past few years, we could witness 20 to 25 percent of the annual rainfall in Gaza in a matter of hours. So you can imagine how devastating that would be for people who have been living in 
makeshift tents, not even really equipped, that are torn out because worn out because of the you know the excessive heat and the humidity in the summer. They live at at the beach, literally at the beach, and there's no more space for them to relocate. Mm-hmm. They have no financial capacity to adapt more, and they will definitely face the consequences of the harsh weather conditions without having access to any opportunity that their conditions will be improved in the near future or until the winter arrives. So this is just, a, you know, a glances from the daily life details of a typical family living in Gaza almost one year from October 7, 23. You're mentioning a bit your action in the region. What is the International Red Cross's response in the region and how is it for you working in such challenging conditions? The International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, is deeply concerned by the regionalization of the conflict in Gaza and Israel. We have been witnessing reports coming from southern Lebanon. The Lebanese Ministry of Health reported of um, hundreds of people have been killed in one day, while there are still families in northern Israel who cannot uh, live in their homes. And uh, we have witnessed the consequences of the of the armed conflict that started or ignited um, on October 7th in Ga- both Gaza and Israel. And we fear that we would witness the same thing happening in other areas beyond. And the International Committee of the Red Cross has been in the region since decades. We know what it means when wars take place. Mm-hmm. We have responded to many emergencies and humanitarian disasters, both uh, natural and human-made in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Israel and the occupied territories, and also in Lebanon. And all efforts must be directed, all efforts of the international community now that has failed so far to put the humanitarian suffering in Gaza to an end, Mm -hmm. their efforts must be concentrated towards the de-escalation and the preservation of uh, civilian life and dignity, and to ensure that all parties to the conflict involved in this regional conflict, adhere and respect the international humanitarian law, the protection of of civilian population, the protection of civilian infrastructure, the protection of medical missions, humanitarian missions, protecting the rights uh, and the treatment and and family links of those deprived of their liberty and the proper management of the dead must be the priorities now for all parties engaged in this conflict. Mm -hmm. We do not want to witness any further suffering, any further destruction, any further preventing the the young generations from a bright future in this region because it has been mired with armed conflicts uh, for decades now. So we are, you know, we're mobilizing our efforts with our partners in the region to respond to the urgently needed humanitarian assistance, Mm -hmm. whether in Gaza, in southern Lebanon, in Yemen, in Syria. However, we cannot continue to respond to this unless first parties to the conflict adhere to their legal obligations under the international humanitarian law, facilitate access to humanitarian aid, and ensure the protection of the humanitarian teams on the ground. And you said something very important at the beginning about more people having to leave their homes in the northern part of Israel and the southern part of Lebanon. Where are these people going while the situation is unfolding there? Because of you know the exchange of, of armed hostilities between Israel and Lebanon, particularly in southern Lebanon, uh, of course, popular families on both sides of the border will have to flee and evacuate. We witnessed evacuation order issued yesterday by the Israeli military for the for the people in the Bekaa area, uh, which is located in southern Lebanon. And we have seen, you know, uh, footage of uh, uh, long queues of families moving in their cars towards up to the north in Lebanon. We have seen this in a different manner, in a more indignified manner in Gaza, when people had to collect whatever is left of their belongings Mm -hmm. in a very short time move their makeshift tents using vehicles or if they can afford the transportation fees or donkey carts, carts dragged by donkeys or even walk on their feet for miles seeking um, a safe haven, whether it's in in another area or a hospital uh, or to stay with their friends or relatives. Mm -hmm. So over one year now, we have been witnessing vividly the consequences of displacing civilian populations and Gaza is a unique context because we have been existing in Israel and the occupied territory since 1967. And we have witnessed many rounds of escalations and armed conflicts, but it's nothing comparing to, to the current, to the ongoing conflict. And we do not want to see this being carried to uh, other regions or being replicated further in the region because the consequences are indescribable. The human suffering is indescribable. 
How are the people of Gaza coping? You talk to them daily. Has all hope been lost? Are they hoping for intervention and de-escalation? I cannot speak for the entire population in Gaza, but I can give you an example of what people tell us whenever they meet with us in field, when we bring, you know, mm-hmm. water or any other um, humanitarian items that they need. First question they ask is, when is this going to stop? The second question would be, when can we return back to our homes? Knowingly that many of them have already lost their homes, have already lost their entire neighborhoods and infrastructure, yet they still grab on the hope that they will restore normalcy. They will have a life back sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, since 2008, there has been at least six large-scale military operations in Gaza. Two of them took place in 2023, including this armed conflict. Aside from this current ongoing conflict, people, to some extent, managed to rebuild their lives because it was limited comparing to this one. However, it's beyond everyone's capacity to just collect themselves, rebuild their lives, and continue living. As I mentioned, the humanitarian space in Gaza has shrunk significantly. We need access of unimpeded and safe humanitarian aid to come into Gaza. We need the security measures and guarantees to be ensured by both parties to the conflict so that humanitarian teams can bring this aid to all those in need, both in northern Gaza and in southern Gaza and in the middle of Gaza Strip. Medical missions must be protected. Mm -hmm. Many of the doctors and nurses and the healthcare staff have been either killed or injured or detained. This is not a space, this is not a condition where a humanitarian worker or a medical worker can operate, can save lives. In certain situations, it is a life-saving work, and it must be facilitated, and it's a shared responsibility by all the parties of the conflict that are engaged in this nightmare. The international humanitarian law says that humanitarian aid should be reaching the area of conflict without obstacles. Is there sufficient humanitarian aid reaching the Gaza Strip? It is never enough, because simply, as long as there is generating, you know, hostilities generate and they continue to happen, this means or translates into more and more of the humanitarian needs that are unmet. Mm -hmm. It's beyond all the humanitarian sector's capacity to respond to the humanitarian suffering in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we need the cessation of the hostilities. And secondly, we need humanitarian aid to pour into Gaza. And I'm talking about food and water and spare parts for engines that uh, feed, you know, run run hospitals and medical facilities and then fuel. And there's, everything is is lacking in Gaza and everything is needed in Gaza. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this must be arriving constantly, unimpededly and safely. If this is ensured, if this happens, perhaps humanitarian agencies can perform better, can bring more aid to the people that they deserve and need and wait for. And if we consider, you know, the current situation and considering the the last 48 hours, another humanitarian tragedy is unfolding Mm -hmm. in northern Israel and southern uh, Lebanon. And we have witnessed also an escalation in Yemen. So this has to come to an end. And people must have a respite from the fighting and the conflict. They just need to collect themselves. There are many families who haven't yet been able to find the, the, you know, the, the human remains of their loved ones or retrieve their loved ones from under the rubble of their houses Mm -hmm. and give them a decent burial and grief. There are many people who are suffering from from different illnesses. They are not injured, you know, by an explosion, but they are sick. There are many cancer patients. There are many persons with disabilities. There are many pregnant women who need access to frequent healthcare service. That is not available because many hospitals have come to rubble or are pushed out of service. There is no provision of healthcare service at the primary healthcare level, which puts more and more pressure on the already functional hospitals. And these hospitals are suffering from shortages in the medical supplies, medical teams, or fuel, because they run only on generators fed on, you know, by fuel now. Mm -hmm. And this is one main area of need, the access to healthcare service. The infrastructure is devastated. There is no water and wastewater treatment plants or facilities that are functional, which means that untreated sewage water is spreading everywhere, covering many streets where people live in tents. And then there will be floodings because of the rainwater, 
because these facilities are not operational. And this is one of our main priorities now to prepare for the winterization in partnership with other actors in Gaza Strip. But we need access of humanitarian aid into Gaza Mm -hmm. in order to prevent a further catastrophe. And this is only at the Gaza-Israel conflict level. And probably people are asking you these questions about when it is going to end and when can they return to their homes, hoping that you know more as part of an international organization. But what can the international community do to improve the situation? The International Committee of the Red Cross is an international humanitarian neutral intermediary between armed conflicts. We have gained the trust for over decades, you know, from all sides to play this role, to help um, implement ceasefire negotiations or deals once they are realized. It's not our responsibility. We do not engage in the negotiations. However, we facilitate Mm -hmm. the implementation that brings suffering to an end, that reunites families with with their loved ones on both sides of the border, like we did in last November, Mm -hmm. uh, when there was a one-week ceasefire uh, between, uh, you know, Hamas and Israel. And we wish to see this coming any moment soon. And we stand more than ready to start implementing any agreement once it's reached and announced. And once these, you know, all the measures and precautions are provided by both parties. And back to your question, the international community must have a say now. After one year from the conflict in Gaza and Israel, and with the further escalation in southern Lebanon and northern Israel, all efforts must be directed towards the de-escalation, the prevention of further humanitarian catastrophe, the preservation of this, you know, the human life and dignity, mm-hmm. to protect thousands of families from losing their loved ones or their homes or losing the hope for a better future. As I mentioned, this region has witnessed countless number of catastrophes and disasters, and this has come to an end. And only political will can enforce this. The humanitarian situ- solution is not enough. The military solution is not enough. And the ICRC has an extensive experience in armed conflicts, and they understand well the level of consequences and the amount of work that is needed to help people rebuild their lives. And that's a responsibility of the entire international community. Thank you, Hisham. And thank you, Georgi. I am Evie Kiori, and this was Today in the EU podcast. Visit your active to stay on top of the latest news. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can find us on all streaming platforms. You can get in touch with us by leaving a comment or a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Your reviews help us a lot to spread the word about our work, but also understand what topics you like listening to. This episode was produced by Miriam Sain de Tejada, Charles Cohen, and me. Thank you for tuning in, and until tomorrow morning. As part of our commitment to accuracy, inclusion and transparency, Euractiv is part of the Trust Project.